You are watching Area DMG. Big difference between me at 15 and me at 26 when I finished uh, I was working in her 
characters. On top of that, um, you know, I got to know the characters better. Even though I had a good outline for the story, there were things I changed in the ending of the fourth book. And I am going to try to avoid spoilers here if you haven't read the fourth book, or the third book, or the second or the first. Oh, well, if you haven't read the first book, sorry, you are going to be spoilers. But um, I did come to understand the characters better, and so I did change some things in the final draft of the final book because of that greater understanding. Those weren't selling millions of copies back then. 
Um, this is free Harry Potter, you know? Um, free Lord of the Rings films. So yeah, it, it, it was something I had to deal with, but I tried not to let it mess with me. Um, what would you say are some uh, inspirations that you took um, from other fantasy movies or books oh, that wow. influenced your work in Aragon? Um, well, I'm a huge fan of stuff. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So, I mean, I mean, I was massively influenced uh, by Lord of the Rings, of course. You can't write a fantasy now, it's not being influenced by Lord of the Rings. Um, uh, the Bulgarian Atlanta by David Eddings. Stepping up a little bit in the age, uh, the Magician and Sequels by Feist, including the Empire Trilogy, and Jan Works that he co authored, awesome stuff. Uh, Tad Williams, Memory Sorrow and Thorn, uh, Doom by Frank Herbert, Anne McCaffrey, Andre Norton, the, uh, the Red Wall series. Um, Jane Dolan, uh, Narnia, Corbin Gus Trilogy, by Mervyn Peake, The World War of Wars, by E.R. Edison, Excalibur, by Austin Bill, and on and on and on. I think even A Wizard of Earth, by Christina Le Guin. I mean, all of this fed into what I wanted to write. And I didn't know why I was going to be published. I just wanted to write. My goal was to, I had two goals with Eric. One, see if I could produce 500 pages, because I had never done that before. Two, write a combination of all the things I love in fantasy, sort of an archetypal hero story. So I knew I was playing with tropes that had been used by other authors, and that was okay, this was my take on that. So I knew I wanted the magic sword, the dragon, the wise old mentor, the evil villain. And you know what? And then I threw it in against other herbalists and <laughs> added some spice to the stew. Um, but, but, but ultimately, art is a conversation. It's a conversation with yourself, read and seen and heard, it's a conversation with culture and writers and the audience, and I think the obsession nowadays with making everything 100% unique actually hurts that conversation. I mean, Shakespeare only wrote, what, two or three original stories of his whole life. Everything else was an adaptation. If you give the same story to 10 different authors, you will get 10 different books back. And that's a good thing. That is awesome. You all perceive the world differently. Wait, you went on the second page. You're skipping question on the first page? Because <laughs> my eyes are so, so long, it's like my books. <laughs> but we still want more of them, even if they are long, they are wonderful. Um, if you could go back in time and talk to your younger writing self with your older self wisdom, mm -hmm. um, what would you tell your younger self? Don't worry so much about cutting out adverbs. If they're okay once in a while, passive tense is just fine when you use it consciously. We say, I was born on the 4th of July, not the active version, which would be, my mother gave birth to me on the 4th of July. Stop worrying so much. Plot things out even more, and just say what happens in the story. A beautiful sentence is a beautiful thing, but those who write stand for don't worry about overwriting and writing every single line of the most amazing piece of literature ever, because that would be too difficult to read. Money spent for something to help with writing, or money I earned through writing that I spent on some personal indulgence. Oh. Uh, best writing tool I've bought to date is a Lamy 2000 fountain pen. And no, Lamy Safari fountain pen. I'm sorry. It costs like 20 bucks. They're made in Germany. They're meant for students. They write amazingly. Neil Gaiman uses fountain pens. Uh, Neil Stevenson uses fountain pens. I use fountain pens because it really cuts down on your hands rate. Do not press as hard on the fountain, it glides. If you're writing 10, 20 pages of notes, it really, really helps. Um, two days ago, before I came to this convention, uh, I promise I've signed so many books in my life, literally millions of books, and I've written so many pages by hand, I have broken my hand. I've my, got tendonitis in my right thumb at the moment, so I've got to let that calm down. So, I bought, I spent a huge amount of money, 40 bucks, and I bought a typewriter. And that's going to be showing up in three days later. Wednesday. So, uh, yeah, you know, we get the tools don't matter, but the tools do help. As far as personal indulgences, um, I don't normally talk about this, but I do like um, winking things, and things that go bang, and, and I've been like that since I was three. So, um, yeah, you know, I've got a few swords, I've got a few knives, I've got an only custom knife shop in New York City, and it's 
spend a ridiculous amount of money there. So, um, you know, that's the thing that when I was 14, I always wanted when I was an adult, and now that I am at the age I am, I, you know what, I can afford a nice first one every once in a while. Darn it, I'm not going to feel bad about it. <laughs> so, besides buying pointy things, how, how would you define success like as a writer? How would, what does success Easy. look like to you? And this comes from having grown up in a log cabin where we had to use chewing gum and plug the holes in the logs with rain. And then later on, we in a 90 year old farmhouse with asbestos shingles were on the walls and mice in the walls, and we used to keep the whole place with a wood stove. My answer to success as a writer is two things. One, I don't have to worry about food. When I go to a restaurant or when I go shopping, I don't have to worry about buying food. And two, the roof doesn't leak. <laughs> and three, actually the third one, people seem to actually have been positively touched by and influenced by the stuff I've written, which is what every author hopes for. You know, there have been kids who've been named after my characters. You know, I've heard from people who even heard the convention here, who wrote you know, books that really meant something to them and helped, helped them in a difficult part of their life. That is all any author could ever hope for. So to me, that's success. Um, I mean, everything else is nice, but as long as I don't have to worry about paying for the bacon on my plate, I'm happy. Um, I actually saw Christopher a few years ago at a signing in Tanner Cover when he came into Blizzard. And, um, That's how we travel. Uh, <laughs> and I remember you talked a lot then about the future of publishing mm -hmm. with electronic devices. Could you maybe tell us a little bit? It's actually that? swinging back now. More people are reading hard covers. More people are actually reading hard, you know, paperbacks and stuff like that. Especially they say the millennial generation, which I'm supposedly part of. Uh, I think the dog uh, ebooks are awesome and have a huge impact. And I would never read a book on a computer if I can help it because I work on it. Or on a typewriter or something like that. And I don't want to stare at a computer screen for my leisure time. You know, especially because I also like to play video games a lot. So um, that's a separate conversation. So I really want to have my amount of time spent staring at a screen. Simple as that. Um, but I do think that um, publishing now is, you know, sci-fi, fantasy, and you know, fiction is taking the world by storm, as we all know. And ebooks have made a huge impact, but I think that the part copies of books will never go away. Especially not the fantasy fans. If you like fantasy, you like old things and ancient things and secret things, and if you want that leather-bound copy, you can kill a small mammal with it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure there's many potential writers who are listening to this audience. What would you tell someone who is just starting uh, out? Easy. Uh, and by the way, for everyone on my panels, before you may have heard me say this before, so I apologize for the repetition, but hey, repetition might be good. So, one, read everything. Read what you like, read things outside of your comfort zone. Good writers are good readers. Two, learn everything you can about the language you are writing. And that's the tool of the trade. I know grammar is boring, trust me, I know. But you should know what is, 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 is it a passive tense. You should know about all the clauses. You should be able to work in a diagram sentence. It makes a huge difference. Uh, as I say, you can't break the rules until you understand them, or you shouldn't. Uh, three, write about whatever it is you love the most. There are seven billion some people on the planet. I don't care if you want to write cosplay stuff about flying toasters and, you know, like supernatural crossover with unicorns. It does not matter. I guarantee you, whatever you want to write about, there is some sizable number of people out there who will want to read it as well. So you have an audience. Three or four. Write every single day. It's like practicing a musical instrument. Right every day, it will get easier, it will become a habit, even if it's only 30 minutes. 30 minutes a day adds up. One page a day, hey, at the end of the year, you've got a decent sized book, you know? Write every day. I do not wait for inspiration. I get inspiration about once every three months, which according to Wikipedia, to, uh, once a blue moon, which is about once every three months. So, um, I don't wait for inspiration. I don't wait to feel that natural feeling like, I have to write and tell a story. I get that at the beginning of a project. In the middle of the project, it's more like, oh god, this is ever going to be done. But you know what? You keep working. Next piece of advice plot your story out beforehand. And I mean, seriously, plot it out. You should be able to sit down and tell the story to someone verbally for 
from start to finish, and they should have no question about what happened, why it happened, they should, they should be entertaining. You should know it down to the scene level, like what happens in every single scene. And the reason for this is because plotting and writing are two separate skills. It's, it's like with music. You, you compose a piece of music first, and then you concentrate on performing it as beautifully as possible. And writing is a performance. And lastly, don't give up. I've met a lot of talented people who could be talented authors, but they're never going to get published because they start something and they give up. Or they just don't sit down and write every single day. So don't give up. Persistence beats talent every single day of the year, assuming talent is lazy. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're talented and you work hard, you're going to beat everyone. So that's how writing is. Um, on social media, you talked a little bit about the sci-fi book that you're working on. Um, you're stalking me. <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> um, what can you tell us about that book? Alien spaceships, lasers, explosions, and tentacles. I'll stop doing that. This this book is my attempt to write a love letter to the genre of science fiction as much as Aragon is my love letter to fantasy. It is more of an adult novel, but if you enjoy Aragon and sequels, you'll enjoy the sci-fi book as well. I love the title. I can't tell you it's top secret. Someday I will think of top secret and mess with everyone, but for the time being, it's not top secret, but it is top secret, and I can't tell you. Um, uh, it's a big book. Um, you might be able to kill a medium-sized mammal with it. <laughs> uh, it's about the size of an inheritance at the moment. And yeah, I've poured my heart and soul into this, so hopefully people are going to enjoy it. So far, everyone who's read it, early readers have um, really liked it, so you know, that's encouraging. I'm making a few tweaks right now through my agent, giving some advice, and making a few changes, giving some advice. And then we're going to see if we can get a publication date. So, uh, further bulletins as if it's warrant. That's very exciting. Um, what would you say is your writing for tonight? Like, what is really bad for you as a writer? Um, aside from writing Aria, uh, <laughs> uh, probably sleep deprivation. Probably sleep deprivation because uh, I have a horrible habit of staying up too late. Because I what people tell me to do, and so if I have a deadline, I'll just, you know, I'll work really hard, then I want time for myself, so stay up too late. So I really try to avoid that. That's why I did not write this current work under contract, so that I didn't feel like I could be forced to do it. It's something I was doing out of love and excitement, and so, hey, I work during the day, and you know what, I can let go relax during the evening, because I don't feel like I need to deliver this in two and a half weeks to my publisher. I've done it. I did that for 12 years. I don't want to do that again. So hopefully that shows the quality of the final product also. Um, I think we're going to just do some quick round questions, and then we're going to open it to audience questions. Um, Sounds good. All right. How many hours a day do you write? Um, depending <laughs> on how sharp my brain is, anywhere from 8 to 12. Wow. Wow. That's a lot. Um, if you didn't write, what would you do for work? Um, probably a professional artist, woodworker, sort of step, or video game player. <laughs> <laughs> or science. I do love science also. Do you read your own book reviews? Good Lord, no. Why would I? <laughs> <laughs> no! No, 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 no. I, I was sure the green room with Penn and Penn and Penn and Teller, and he gave me some advice that I've adhered to religiously ever since, which is never read anything with your own name in it, never listen to anything with your voice in it, never watch anything with your face in it, you will be a happy, happy person. And it is true, because the, the thing is, you write a book, publish it, you can't change it. You know what? If someone doesn't like it, that's too bad. If someone likes it, awesome. And the worst thing is, positive reviews are not helpful either, because in a positive review, someone may praise something that you did without thinking. You did it unconsciously. Now you're self-conscious, and that wrecks your ability then to write when you did previously. So no, I don't think what is your um, favorite childhood book? Uh, oh, Wizard of the Sea and the two sequels, Dune, okay. Anna Karenina, and The Hobbit. Mm -hmm. um, what's your Game of Thrones house? Or your West Girls house? I actually haven't been Game of Thrones. <laughs> I know! Oh, I actually took a test 
<laughs> we get it. <laughs> Not by me, but I actually contacted a fan who I had seen doing 3D renders fan art swords. I like to suck. He's in New Zealand. Raul was his name. And I contacted Raul and he worked with me to create a 3D model of Tingle Tingle Death. And then we got it milled by a CNC machine out of uh, polycarbonate and got it polished up by a jeweler and wire wrap and handle silver wire and get a hand tooled leather sheath made for the sword. And if you go on my Instagram, if you scroll back a couple of months, you'll find I have some video of the sword and it looked amazing. Twelve times, which I know is ridiculous. Um, but I was wondering, what was the hardest point of view for you to write from? Because you switched various times. Uh, what was the hardest point of view to write from? Um, in the books. You know, so there was a point of view gave me a little trouble, but I enjoyed it so much I can't say it gave me trouble. I think the actually Aragon was probably the hardest because Rory has already grown up. He knows who he is and what he wants. His stuff is easy, easier for me to write. And not so why I'm so determined and clear of what she wants. She's, she's a total badass. She was, she was easy in some ways. I think it was Erica. Because if you look at his dialogue, Erica literally just walks around and basically asking questions all the time. Why? How? What? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's a little clueless sometimes. So, um, he was the best one. Uh, another question? Yes, back on the wall. I am very impressed. How many bands does it have? Eight. Eight! Alright, so the reason there is a puzzle ring in my books is because I was on this touring the self-published edition of Aragon and I was in high school in Texas and one of the, the, the head, I don't know, the head librarian, her husband travels around and he had a puzzle ring and she gave it to me because I love reading puzzles. And I solved that puzzle ring the very day I wrote the scene when Aragon solved his. Uh -huh. Because I was Sorry, I don't want to swear. I was not going to let my character solve the ring before I solved it. So I <laughs> Very cool. I love those, love those rings. Uh, boy, so many questions. Um, Burn chair. Um, so I really like the languages in your book. How do you come up with those? Um, so the first language I created was an ancient language, um, which I based partially on the Old Norse. I needed the word for fire, and so I was looking through a dictionary of word origins and came across the word brisketer, listed as a very obscure or source word for our word for fire. And I loved it so much, I started doing more research about it, Old Norse. And the way you create languages, you basically come up with a word or two, you like the sound of it, and you say, okay, this is the vowels we're going to have, this is how the consonants are going to put together, and then you start working on the grammar and the vocabulary, and before you know it, it's 30 years later, and you're J.R.R. Tolkien. <laughs> Others I invented from scratch. Um, actually, does anyone have a copy of the oldest of them? Whoever can get to me first. <laughs> <laughs> so, I will read you the Elvish blessing in the ancient language, but I have to apologize because I have an absolutely horrendous Elvish accent. <laughs> and the reason for that is that in the ancient language, you were supposed to roll your R's on the tip of your tongue. Maybe you would in Spanish or Italian. And I just can't do that. <laughs> the only way I can roll my R's, and I apologize, I know this sounds insane. The only way I can roll my R's is by wiggling my uvula. That's the thing in the back of your throat. So, I would have wiggled my uvula at you guys. <laughs> and I hope you like it too. I will try to stare at you on the film, but I will leave the entire film. Do I ring you on the fire? Well, uh, I am a much bigger fan of dwarf language, actually, because you can just sink your teeth into it. And unlike ancient language, I have an excellent dwarf, dwarven accent. And that's because of the dwarf language you were supposed to pull your R's by moving your uvula. <laughs> so, so this is the angry dwarf complaining about Aragon and Sephira being in. Mountains. And uh, this is what angry 
not, not necessarily an actor, but I almost think of like, like a baritone female or a deep female opera singer who still sounds young. You know, that's the trick. I don't want to, we don't want to voice that sound like someone who's in their 60s or their 50s. You want someone who sounds young but mature, and that is very hard to find in a woman's voice because a lot of women with voices like that are not actors necessarily. They have a lot of higher voices than like many actors. We want to need someone with some weight to their voice. That's what I would hear. I mean, feminine, young, but there is a weight of maturity to her voice that, um, I mean, she is a dragon, so yes, that's kind of what I would imagine. Um, yes? Uh, this, all right, I was about to say, is there any possibility for taking a second crack at an inheritance film series? <laughs> <laughs> everything with the 
flashlight looking for what is causing this horrendous, horrendous shrieking noise. And as the beam of light passes across the sofa, I see projected on the wall the most terrifying, barbed shadow that you can imagine. As in, this looks like something from the alien film, okay? <laughs> and I look to see what is casting this horrendous, terrifying shadow. And sitting on the back of my sofa is a Jerusalem cricket. <laughs> There is a giant version of the Jerusalem cricket that is literally about this big. Wow. It's about the size of a mouse. And they live in New Zealand, and they go by another name. They're known as Weta. And if you know anything, that's a special effects company. They did all the Lord of the Rings effects and stuff. And the reason that company is named Weta is because apparently Peter Jackson finds those crickets absolutely terrifying also. <laughs> so, you can blame crickets for both Weta, the company, and the Razak in my books. <laughs> <laughs> we have about five more minutes, so we'll take a couple more questions. Um, yes, right, right, right. Hi. Hi. So, the only reason, like, your books were kind of my introduction to fantasy, and it's the only reason that I am was interested in blacksmithing, and the only reason I'm a jeweler now, uh, why I do that for a profession, but if you said you like pointy things, um, <laughs> Would you ever be open to a fan sending you a version of one of the swords, but not how you imagine it, like their own rendition of that? Would I ever be open to a fan sending me uh, their version of one of the swords in the books that they have made, blacksmithing, that sort of thing? But not only would I be open to it, you might, uh, you should watch out, you might need a character. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Swords are a very fast way to, to earn my gratitude and friendship. Yes, so. uh, my address is on my website for fan mail. I trust my fellow swords, so yes. Yes, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, oh, How did Angela Robles kill those soldiers in the last book when 
she did her fiddling bit of magic. Boy, wouldn't it be cool to know? Stay sharp. 